summer is singing in streets again, and summertime's travels have now begun. The cuckoo sings of the burnished grain, and long journeys gilded by the sun. We we'll soon have the holiday passenger traffic with us. But between us, I think we can deal with all the... The superintendent of operating speaks in the ears of his timetable brains, who sit in their offices calculating how to fit in fast summertime trains. Cudgel your brains for summertime trains. Draw in a train for the passengers waiting to hear cuckoos singing a highland fling. Draw in a line for a non-stop to Edinburgh over the time. And so the new service comes into its hour. The morning is June, the weather is fine. At King's Cross Depot of Motive Power, the drivers come in to sign on the line. Bob Marable, top link train driver, who's always a punctual arriver, wears boots, foot plate size, has color light eyes, and engine oil in his saliva. Rolly Russell, his mate in the team, often sprays out his tonsils with steam and treats gravel rashes by damping down ashes and using the paste like cold cream. The 9.30 non-stop train to Edinburgh, the Elizabethan, will leave from platform 5. Passengers for Dundee and Aberdeen travel in the front of the train. At King's Cross, the coaches are filling with passengers. Porters are willing to carry their cases and find them their places for the tanner, or even a shilling. The Elizabethan, will leave from platform five. Passengers for Dundee. Like a general gathering forces, the chef's checking up his resources. All the pains in your belt, Mr. Wheeler, can melt and roll your eyes round with his sauces. Though the guard may look calm and laconic, his obsession with time is quite chronic. But a punctual start binds the train to his heart. The relationship's purely platonic. At platform five, the Elizabethan, a special express of the holiday season, summons its strength. And the time to depart marks an ending for some, but for many, a start. the engine goes with a swing and a shine past the engine sheds, there's a man on the line who gave her that shine. He's the fitter. His was the skill. His the hands that uncoupled her rods, stripped her gear, packed her glands with his firm, skillful hands. And the boy was one of that servicing crew who gave care and craft to each thread on each screw and made it fit true. They're the fitters, the men with the cunning to bring through each big end and piston, valve, spindle and spring, all that power and swing. The Briffey's Archdeacon of Elegance serves coffee with impartial sentiments, cigars for the swells, bath buns for blonde bells, and fags for the lodging arrangements.
The passengers sitting at buffet tables, the Howards, the Berts, the Cynthias, the Mabels, enjoying the comfort and ease in their seats, careless of crumbs in turnips or pleats, admire the gleam on the chromium plate, the polish on tables, the unfaded state of curtains and fabrics. But rarely give thought to the long years of training, the practice that taught men in large workshops the best way to take a carriage to pieces and how to remake it better than new. The seats that are sat on had to be made to welcome all shapes. First, the material that mustn't fade or wilt under pressure was cut with a blade skillfully guided, then skillfully sewn, while windows were painted, then carefully scraped, and taps were fitted in shining chrome. Then the seats were upholstered, material bolstered. And while a man was writing a sign, and others were putting that last mirror shine on metal and paint, the seat was finished. And those who ride in its regal embrace can truthfully claim to sit in the pride and work of a king. As time gets on, so people get thinner, unless they take lunch or midday dinner. So the kitchen car prepares to fill the waistcoat of Jack and the waistline of Jill. Watch them consistently filling the gaps in their faces with food without filling their laps. They wouldn't be eating as smooth in most cars, or ocean steamers, or even some bars. As undisturbed as Robinson Crusoe by the train's motion, they swallow their meats. What in the railways allows them to do so? One of the factors enabling these feats of filling stomachs without filling laps is the state of the track which depends on these chaps of the maintenance gangs. The chaps who see that the rails are tight in their several chairs. Who see that they're straight and on the level, unlike crooks or stairs. Who see that the chairs are firmly fixed, that no evil disturbs the sleepers. Who see that the gap's not been stretched in the night by clandestine creepers. Who see that this very important small gap will not cause any damage by wrapping some diner's first-class Adam's apple in chicken or cabbage. Who see that the passengers riding in clover can take meals on velvet and 90 or over. While the side-slipping countryside changes to town, meadow sweet speedwell, charter and gown, dreamlike in boxes, unseen watchful eyes, path setting panel, tell us no lies. Watch the trains passing, guide her with care, junction and crossing, points in a pair. With a turn of the wrist, the click of a switch, track circuit magic, vault of the witch, out of York City and on to the north, past Durham, Newcastle, over Tweed to the fourth. Now beyond York, the Scots crew prepare to relieve the strain on the English pair. No driver of trains is more proud of his Scottish descent than MacLeod. He insists every engine has pipes to each piston and buttons in its box for MacLeod. His mate, Mungo Scott's cursed with bristle that's as tough as a John Knox epistle. When he kissed a young lass in the dark for a lark, she asked, Was that you or a thistle? 